Following 13 years of active military duty, uh, he was hired as the chief forecaster at Dugway uh, Proving Grounds in Utah, and he began his career with the National Weather Service in Flagstaff, Arizona, before being transferred to the lovely Birmingham, Alabama. So, John, thank you very much, and please join us. I'd like to talk to you this morning um, about tornado threat assessment and damage analysis. Um, looking back at April 27th, um, if you're looking for great pictures of tornadoes, we're not going to do that today. Um, frankly, I've seen enough of that, and if you're from the Birmingham area, I know you have too. But we're going to look at um, how we assess the threat for tornadoes uh, from the National Weather Service perspective, and then talk a little bit about how we do our damage analysis and storm survey process uh, to evaluate our performance at the National Weather Service. We can see through time that uh, there's been a general increase in the number of tornadoes across uh, Alabama from 1950 through 2011. Uh, while that may seem striking, there's some good reason behind that, and we'll talk about that. But you can see the general trend is a mild upward uh, slope that we see peaking with just this year. Through the end of April, we exceeded our previous record, which was 94 tornadoes in a year, with 121 tornadoes. And of course, 109 of those occurred in April. So in just one month, we exceeded the previous annual record in Alabama. That's what you call hopefully a once in a lifetime event, uh, an extreme event which we don't ever hope to see again. When we take a little bit of a more in-depth look at the information, we compare the increase in number of the weak tornadoes, the F0s and the F1s, versus the strong and violent tornadoes. Uh, the F2 and F3 would be considered strong, and the violent are the EF4 and EF5 tornadoes. Generally speaking, there's a, uh, a steady trend of the strong and violent tornadoes as we go through time. However, we see more weak tornadoes. Anybody want to take a guess as why that might be? Global warming? How many say global warming? How about increased population and reporting capability? I think in years gone by, back in the 70s and even into the 80s, we had, might have had a lot of those little weak tornadoes that touched down and made the report back to the feed store and didn't make it any farther out in the rural portions of the state. Um, a lot of people didn't really understand when they were looking at tornado damage, thought it might have been wind damage, and then assessed that and, and didn't get those reports into us. Uh, I don't think there's probably, uh, there might be one or two of us in this room that don't have a cell phone on us today. Anybody? Doesn't have a cell phone? Okay, there's no, none. So what do we do when we see something now? We see a wreck on the highway, we see a storm, we pick up our phones and we call somebody. Uh, we enter it on a blog with the media or we contact 911, let them know what happened. And that information is flowing to us much more effectively now. And the, the preponderance of those tornadoes uh, are those weak tornadoes, those low-end EF0 and EF1 tornadoes. Looking at it another way, uh, just Separating that out in another graph, we see the trend of those EF2 or greater tornadoes in the red staying very relatively low, perhaps a slight uptick there in the later years, but again, that could be reporting. And then look at the drastic increase on this scale uh, of those weak tornadoes, those EF0 and EF1 tornadoes. In Alabama, um, unlike other portions of the country, one of the challenges that we have is that we have virtually no month that is immune from tornadoes. Uh, if you go up to Minnesota, Wisconsin, the northern tier of states, you can pretty much rule out tornadoes probably from November 15th, maybe through February 15th. Those hardcore winter months, you're not going to have a threat of tornadoes. Alabama has a bimodal distribution of torna tornadoes. Uh, we have the classic spring season, March, April, and May. And then we have a secondary severe weather season, which is November and December. Yesterday was our fall severe weather awareness day. The reason behind that is pretty simple. You have a clash of air masses. In the spring, we have the cold air that's being replaced by the warm air. And in the fall, we have the warm air that's being replaced by the cold air as the seasons changed. Uh, and believe me, there's nothing more humbling than having to issue tornado warnings around Thanksgiving and Christmas. Um, in recent years, I believe it was just last year uh, or the year before, we had tornadoes in January and February. That's not a real kind of a common uh, understanding of the general population. When we talk about the uh, people moving into the area, the transitory nature of people, students coming down to the university, 
A lot of people coming in from other portions of the country can easily get caught off guard by this uh, statistic that we have tornadoes basically year-round and that bimodal distribution. Of course, in the summer months, we have the landfalling hurricanes, and that focus area is mainly down along the Gulf Coast, um, where I understand you know, there's higher wind uh, construction standards down there. But as we get farther away from the coast and we have the threat for the spring and fall severe weather, uh, we ha don't have those standards in this area. Rounding out, kind of summarizing April 27th, um, it was indeed a, a major catastrophic event, an extreme event, the second deadliest tornado outbreak in Alabama. The fifth deadliest, although the numbers are kind of changing, it could very easily become the fourth deadliest U.S. tornado outbreak in history. Uh, we had five of the top ten longest track tornadoes in Alabama on one day. Usually when you talk about an extreme event, uh, good day fishing, you know, kind of happens once in a while and you might get one lunker and, and get that, you know, record fish. We had five of those record fish in one day out of the top ten. Eleven violent tornadoes in a single day. That's unheard of, unsurpassed in Alabama history. Thirty-seven is the 30-year average of the number of tornadoes per year. We nearly doubled that on April 27th. We, we, we've had 38 violent tornadoes from 1950 to 2010. So you compare that 11 to the 38, we had roughly a third of the violent tornadoes in history in one day in Alabama. Most tornadoes in, in a single day record, interestingly enough, we had a tornado outbreak on April 15th. Does anybody remember that? Uh, a lot of people don't, and we, we're calling it the forgotten tornado outbreak. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately rather, there weren't any violent tornadoes with that system and we only had seven fatalities in the state. Of course, then we surpassed that again just 12 days later on April 27th, 62 tornadoes in a single day, 121 tornadoes through a April, breaking the previous record, and the second longest Alabama tornado track on record, 129 miles. That tornado stretched from nearly the Mississippi state line up through Cordova and into Marshall County. The Hackleberg tornado was actually longer, however, there were 12 miles of it that extended into Tennessee. So as far as miles in Alabama, it didn't set the record. And finally, 1,206 miles. If you put those tornado tracks end to end in Alabama, you get 1,200 miles of tornado tracks. That goes from Birmingham to Boston. Okay, that's perspective right there. Here's a map of the tracks of the tornadoes across Alabama. Of course, everyone's familiar with the Tuscaloosa and Birmingham tornado track. If you look at the census blocks just in that tornado track from Tuscaloosa to Birmingham, there's 30,000 people that live in those, in those census blocks. So the fact that we had 63 fatalities in that track is, in essence, uh, as, as unfortunate as it is, it's somewhat of a miracle that we didn't see more fatalities with that tornado path, especially when you talk about going through East Tuscaloosa and the populated areas uh, that we've seen uh, that are off to the east and then up in Jefferson County, just to the west of Birmingham, a lot of fairly densely populated areas that the tornado track went through. We see the Cordova tornado track from Pickens County on up to the northeast and the EF5 tornadoes that are kind of in the purple, uh, two of them actually in one county in Marion County and the other one in far extreme northeastern Alabama in DeKalb County. That was uh, quite a day, and, and this was, uh, interestingly enough, as we're progressing as an agency, we're getting involved in a little GIS. We're kind of coming up with this capability, and we're learning how to deal with some other agencies in the exchange of GIS information, which is helpful in analyzing the threat for tornadoes. When we talk about violent long-track tornadoes, we're talking about EF4 and EF5 tornadoes in excess of 100 miles. Since 1950, there's been 26 of those violent tornadoes in excess of 100 miles. 13 of them have happened in Mississippi and Alabama. A little bit of a kind of a focus. There's some counties in Mississippi and Alabama that have had actually three violent tornadoes uh, that have affected them. There's only one other state that has had three. So we're talking county level versus states. And kind of looking at some more statistics here as you kind of consider uh, the task at hand today, where is the threat uh, for tornadoes, when we look at Alabama, we consider the average annual number of tornado fatalities per, per state. Alabama is unfortunately the tops. Uh, we average, uh, I believe that's, that number is, uh, well, my contacts are kind of flaking out on me there. I believe that's six on the average fatalities uh, per year 
from 1981 through 2010. And of course, after this year, that number is going to change as well, and we'll see a little bit of a change with the Joplin results as well. But uh, again, Alabama, if you're looking on the average, stands at the top of that um, list of annual number of fatalities. Looking at the average number, annual number of tornadoes per 10,000 square miles, the distribution gets a little bit changed. You see a little bit more of a focus out in what's known traditionally called the tornado alley, with Kansas actually having the highest number and Mississippi having the second highest. Uh, of course, out in Kansas, they don't have the population we have in the southeast. A lot of that's happening over the wheat fields and the corn fields, where they have those nice roads that are square, and the storm chasers go out there and make that great footage for the Discovery Channel. Uh, that's, you're not going to get that in Alabama. We've got too many trees and hills, uh, very challenging for chasers in Alabama. But still, nonetheless, Alabama is near the top when we look at the average annual number of tornadoes. If we look at tornadoes per county, the, the uh, tip of the hat goes to northeastern Colorado. Um, and again, a very rural, rural area, and we don't really have the type of tornadoes up there in that high plains area that we have down here in the southeast and even in Tornado Alley. We do see a little bit of a peak of activity um, known as Dixie Alley along and north of Interstate 20 uh, and 59 from the Mississippi State Line on up through Birmingham, Tuscaloosa, Birmingham and up towards Huntsville and up to the northeast. When we consider just the average weather patterns, we all kind of know those cold fronts come down from northwest to southeast. They seem to bottom out in the Mississippi level before they lift up to the northeast. You have the combination of that moisture coming out of the Gulf of Mexico that feeds into that clash of air masses. That's why we have this kind of a, a contrast zone when those fronts come into the southeast before it lifts up to the northeast and goes on out into the Atlantic Ocean. So meteorologically speaking, a very favorable area for severe weather and potentially violent tornadoes. The 10-year torna total tornado fatalities per state uh, anybody remember the Super Tuesday outbreak in 2008? Um, it was a very unfortunate, it was in February, uh, western Tennessee, northern Mississippi. Um, and again, this goes through 2010. So as of 20, through the end of 2010, Tennessee had the highest number of tornado fatalities in their state. And that certainly is going to change after 2011. We're going to see uh, Missouri probably leap to the top there with Alabama coming in close behind. Interesting when we look at the number of tornado watches, that should be tornado watches per county, uh, from the Storm Prediction Center in Norman, Oklahoma, uh, you see a lot of threat over the Gulf states, Mississippi and Alabama, They're on a secondary kind of a maximum out there in Oklahoma, the typical tornado alley. When you combine the overall threat for tornadoes from landfalling hurricanes and severe weather, the highest threat, the number of tornado watches, has been over the Gulf Coast states. I think that kind of gets overlooked a lot. Everybody thinks Tornado Alley. Uh, we combat, when we talk about trying to educate the public, we're constantly combating people's biases. Um, they hear all the time, they see the, the storm chasers out there in the Midwest, and they think we're, we're not under a threat down here in the Southeast, when in reality, we have the most significant threat in the country. If we look at just April 2011, the county-based tornado segments, now let me describe the way we record our data. Uh, when we take a tornado track from, let's say, Tuscaloosa County into Birmingham, it counts as one tornado, but it's actually two county segments. Pretty straightforward, right? So each one of these triangles represents a county that was affected by a tornado. So when we left one county and went into another, we put a triangle on there. And you can certainly see a, a peak of activity, uh, especially with the stronger, the violent tornadoes in Alabama from April of 2011. And April 2011, as far as the country is concerned, was an extreme event for all time that we're aware of. At least, well, modern record keeping goes back to 1950. Um, there are some recorded events that go back beyond 1950, but the record keeping was not as consistent through that period of time. We had 747 tornadoes in our country in 2011, and that was an, a record for a given month across the country. And here's kind of what I was alluding to earlier. Um, a researcher by the name of uh, Ashley Walker kind of looked at the frequency of tornadoes in combination with the fatalities. When you look at the relative frequency of killer tornado events, there's a peak that runs from Little Rock down through Memphis and towards Birmingham, north of Tuscaloosa. 
Um, there's several reasons for that. Uh, the tornadoes in this part of the country, a lot of times they happen at night, unfortunately. Um, so there's one factor. Anybody care to guess where the highest density of manufactured homes is? Right underneath this maximum here. Uh, we also have uh, likelihood of those long track violent tornadoes. Forested areas are a concern. Early season storms. One of the victims of the uh, Super Tuesday tornado uh, in West Tennessee stated, we don't have tornadoes this time of the year. So there was a failure on our part to educate people that that threat is every month of the year, every hour of the day uh, to the people so that they're ready and prepared. We don't need that mind, uh, mindset that tornadoes don't happen per given time. So clearly, when we look at the threat to human life, uh, we do have a maximum here that touches into Alabama. Well, let's put that into perspective. Uh, we are talking about an extreme event. And of course, hopefully you all know that there's inherent problems when you statistically analyze a rare event. A lot of times what happens in meteorology, uh, we'll try to do a study to figure out why is it foggy at the Birmingham airport. And that might happen maybe 1 or 2% of the time, or even less for the visibility below a half mile. We'll try to come up with a forecast rule of thumb that says, when this happens, we're going to get fog. Usually what happens when we, when we try to come up with some sort of st statistical understanding of those extreme events, what we wind up doing is finding out we can tell you when it's not going to happen with more reliability than when it will happen. So we can rule out when those extreme events are not going to occur, but we can't really tell you when they will occur. If we look at the area of Alabama, 52,000 square miles, a little bit over 52,000 square miles. If we were to take that 1,200 miles of tornado track in Alabama from, Alabama from April 27th and assume a rather liberal, let's say, half mile track width, we'd come up with 600 square miles. So for April 27th, we affected 1.2% of the total area of Alabama. Now, on one hand, that, you know, we all kind of remember how significant that day was. It seems like it affected a lot of people, but it was only 1.2%. And now when I say it's only 1.2%, realizing that this was the worst by far event, all those other events are a much lower number statistically. I'm not really trying to downplay the chances of tornadoes and the impact. What I'm trying to show here is that if we use a statistical argument for the threat of tornadoes, I think people are going to say, what are the chances of me getting struck by another one again? Why should I do something? Doswell, Chuck Doswell, who's a, a nationally renowned tornado researcher and storm chaser, photographer, um, went, did an exercise a few years ago and talked about the national wide, nationwide probabilities of being struck by a tornado. The chances of being struck by a violent EF4 or EF5 tornado were approximately one in a 100,000 one in 100,000 for a given square mile. For a certain home, the chances were three in 10 million. Now keep in mind, this, this is the entire statistics for the whole country. You're comparing the tornado frequencies of Montana, Alabama, and putting them all together. Uh, I could not find any studies that were geared towards Alabama, but I think if we looked at that comparative map, some of those comparative maps earlier, we could kind of draw a conclusion that perhaps our probabilities in Alabama are maybe eight or nine or ten times what they might be in Montana. Over a 30-year period, the chances of a home being uh, hit by a violent tornado are three in a million. Your chances of dying in an auto accident over that 30-year period are five in a thousand. So if we try to use the statistical argument of the threat, we're going to lose. So we have to appeal to something else. It's not obvious how to make the decision to have or not have a tornado shelter built. The decision has to be a personal one. And that's Chuck Doswell's quote. Let's shift gears a little bit and talk about how we go about doing damage analysis. Um, when we have a severe weather event, immediately after that event, we're kind of going into an assessment mode. Our work does not end after that last warning is issued. We might be, if we're lucky, halfway through the event. The reason we go back and look at and try to do damage assessment is so that we can verify our products and services. We do a little check on how accurate our forecasts were, what did we hit, what did we miss, um, is there any improvements that we can gain from the system 
as we try to uh, Im protect life and property, which is the mission of the National Weather Service. Improve warnings and save more people, that's the goal. The other is to document weather events. Uh, through history, you know, we couldn't get those statistics that we were looking at earlier if we didn't document those. Some of the other benefits are for the recovery of the affected people in the disaster area. When FEMA comes calling and, and we try to make a disaster declaration, they want to know hard numbers. How many tornadoes were there? How many people were affected? Secondarily, when people try to make insurance claims, as often happens after kind of a marginal event, we might ne not get a whole lot of reports for a given location. And when they file that claim with the insurance agent, the insurance agent says, where's the reports of severe weather? There's nothing there. So by encouraging people to give us storm reports, we'll help improve our accuracy and we'll also help the community recover from the event, whether it's at the FEMA level or just the insurance level. Since 2007, the National Weather Service has been using the enhanced Fujita scale. Um, that was actually uh, an improvement over the old Fujita scale. Um, and we, we took together wind engineers, structural engineers, with meteorologists, set them all down in a room and hashed it out, and that took about two years. So, you know, the, the process working at the speed of federal government applied there. Um, it is an improvement because prior to the enhanced Fujita scale, it was just kind of a look at it and say, that looks like uh, an EF5. Eh, I think that's EF3. And I would go out on storm surveys with uh, Brian Peters, who many of you may know in the Birmingham area, and say, Brian, why did you do that? Well, it just is an EF3. So now with the enhanced Fujita scale, we have standards that we all can be on the same page when we try to analyze storm damage. They've, we've given something to our weather service offices called the EF kit, the EF uh, kit where we go out and we all have a guidebook to assess the damage. We've gone through training, um, albeit, you know, I, I have enough engineering sense to know how to perhaps pound a nail. That's about it, okay? Um, but we can look at some of the structural integrity of a building kind of gauge whether it was a well-built home or a poorly built home and how we compare that to the expected wind speeds. We'll get into that in detail. Um, this is kind of based on a, a kind of a the Bible I guess of damage assessment, storm damage assessment which was written by Chuck Doswell. I have no allegiance with Chuck Doswell. He's just very prominent in our science. Um, back in 2003 he put together a guide on how to do damage assessment back in the days of the old F scale. We use those principles because they're, I think they're fairly sound. They might need a little updating uh, to kind of, with some new images, put it online, et cetera, uh, that we can base our assessments in that EF scale. Data collection, boy, we, uh, data collection, we collect it from anywhere we can, basically. Lots of sources of information that we use. Um, typically, we will send out a team of two meteorologists with a laptop and a GPS uh, hooked up to it and a GPS-based camera, and we enter it into a storm damage assessment kit. We're in the Birmingham office, we're a little bit on the leading edge, as I mentioned earlier, in the GIS realm in the Weather Service. Um, our work this spring assessing the storm damage has really become a model for the rest of the agency. When the director of the Weather Service came down and the director of NOAA actually came into our office, we had it up on the situational awareness display, and they were like, ooh, what's that? So let me tell you what that is, ma'am. Uh, and they have decided that they want that program to go national. It's not something we developed. We were beta testing it, and we just happened to be the right place at the right time to do that. When we get an extreme situation like April 27th, we don't hesitate to call on nationally recognized experts. Anybody know Tim Marshall or have heard of Tim Marshall before? He holds a degree in meteorology and a degree in engineering, works with Texas Tech and Haig Engineering, I believe it is, in Texas. Um, he is the uh, on-call guy when there's a major tornado outbreak to come to your site and help you analyze data. We have another gentleman that's actually in the weather service that helped develop that EF kit, Jim Ledoux, who came out. So we had two nationally renowned experts that were helping us assess what we saw on the ground. It was very gratifying that many of the conclusions that they drew with their level of experience and having put the coursework together are the same conclusions that we had. So I kind of feel that unfortunately we've got a level of experience in Birmingham that has putting, is putting us on par with what they're doing and, and we're, we were definitely pleased to have them out with us um, in this unfortunate circumstance. This is just kind of a snapshot of what we do in our EF kit 
For each, we have about 28 different damage indicators, uh, whether that's a, a residence, commercial structure, schools, professional buildings, uh, metal buildings, canopies, towers, poles, and vegetation. Um, so we go through, when we get onto a site, and we're trying to assess the magnitude of the storm, we say, okay, what are we looking at here? Well, if we're looking at a, a single, a single residence home or one or two family residence, we come down to damage indicator number two. Once we determine the type of structure or the item we're looking at, we have degrees of damage. And we kind of come down and look at uh, what's the magnitude of the damage, threshold of visible damage, all the way down to number seven, exterior walls collapsed, nine, all walls co collapsed, 10, destruction of engineered or well-constructed uh, residents, slab swept clean. The columns of numbers over on the right when they came up with the expected wind speeds for the amount of damage, they solicited the opinions of all these experts. And they came out with a lower bound and an upper bound, and they did come up with an expected value. So if we have about 20% of the roof, roof covering materials in number two, gutters uh, and or awning, loss of vinyl or metal siding, we would expect for a up to code structure wind speed of 79 miles per hour to have caused that damage. At that point, okay, let's look at the structure. Let's see, are there hurricane straps? Do we have good construction practices there? Are there any mitigating circumstances? Did something fly into the building and cause that damage? If so, if there's a weakness, we'll take the lower bound value. We'll head down to that lower bound. And we'll say, no, it's more like 63 mile an hour winds that cause that damage. If we come onto a site and we see a well-constructed home J bolts and toenails and hurricane straps and we still have that damage, then we'll say, no, okay, this is, this is the exception. We're gonna go for the upper bound on this range. And again, it was very gratifying to see some of the detailed analysis from the engineers in Tuscaloosa kind of come in very close to what we assessed just by using this uh, kind of back of the envelope or you know guidebook assessment. Uh, we're not really interested in detailed house-to-house -house information. We try to capture the flavor of the tornado, get the beginning point, the end point, and the worst damage. It was very gratifying to know that we were very close with what the engineers found. And I think we'll hear from them later this afternoon, um, and we'll see another picture here in a moment. I'm sure you all are familiar with this more than I am, the, the load bearing, you know, having that load path, that steady load path, and good connection points. I saw a great video on the FEMA site yesterday uh, where they described some of the new construction practices with the brackets and the bolts that are keeping the floors together. Uh, some really great things that are, that are coming down the road, hopefully, as far as construction passes, uh, uh, practices, rather. You all can see some really poor construction practices there with some uh, straight nails and some little straps here versus the clips and the J-bolts on the right. In Alabama, 16% of all residences are manufactured homes. We can't rate a manufactured home anything greater than an EF3. Because at the wind speeds of an EF3, which is about 140 to 160 miles an hour, that mobile home is gone. So if it's anything in excess of 160, I believe it's 165 miles an hour, we really wouldn't know. This is unfortunately what a lot of mobile home sites looked like when we came up to uh, examine the damage on April 27th. This particular home was rather interesting. If you can notice the, uh, the wooden stairs that were constructed quite well in front of the manufactured home, untouched. Look at the damage around the area. The stick-built homes, standing, standing. This home is actually behind the photographer. It flipped up the hill and two people perished in that mobile home. Here's a home in Cordova, mobile home in Cordova. Whether there, were, whether there were hurricane straps or not, it didn't matter. I saw a well-constructed mobile home or well-anchored mobile home, 12 hurricane straps, and all you see is those nice little curly cues as it pulls the straps through the anchors. Hurricane straps, not tornado straps. Uh, very, very humbling, uh, whether it was, again, as, whether it was anchored or not. I saw a 12-anchor mobile home tossed 100 yards. One of the other problems is trees. Uh, in the morning hours of April 27th, we had six fatalities from the winds and the tornadoes that came through there, many of which were caused by trees falling on mobile homes. 
Um, so there's uh, an issue right there. It doesn't take a direct hit from a tornado to cause a fatality in a manufactured home. Some of the construction anomalies from April 27th, and I know you all are going to be thrilled to see these, right? How's that for an attachment point of a sill plate? The old concrete nail. That's not going to hold. Chips the concrete, and the board is gone. J-bolt. Uh, don't know that it was really well anchored in the concrete. I don't know what the mode of failure was there, but it really didn't do its job. Straight nails. Interesting story. A uh, certain meteorologist in the Birmingham market did an interview with my boss about the importance of storm shelters. Did a great job talking about the need for above ground reinforced concrete shelter or an in the ground or a safe room. And then they showed kind of some B-roll, they call it when they go around taking shots of everybody. And there's the power gun doing straight nails in the bottom of the, the wall panels. That's not going to cut it, folks. Straight nails, 214 pounds from the information we have is all it takes to remove that. We need something better to hold that wall together. Here's a case, um, and again, where the walls separated. Once you remove, I'm sure all you know, once you remove that roof, the house is like a house of cards with the walls. And when all you have is gravity and some toenails holding that roof on a home, there's not much hope to keep that home intact. Here's what appears to be a fairly well-built home, a, a literal brick house. Um, I might not be happy with some of the brickwork. It looks a little messy, but let's examine up on the top at the roof line. Kind of missing some grout in there. I don't know if that was perhaps after the construction and as a result of the damage or not, but um, doesn't look like we're well attached there. And look at those. Uh, I don't see any hurricane clips either. So it appears that that's a concrete home with brick right up, very well constructed right up to the roof. And fortunately, the remainder of the house stood, but the roof suffered some damage here. This is a, one of the classic bi-level homes uh, with that split level. We got the garage doors right down here. That failure point, that, uh, as far as when we go out and survey, we look for that split level home and where's the garage doors, and that's typically the first point of failure. Those garage doors came in, in this instance, as the tornado approached from this direction, the winds went into the home, blew out the basement to the left, and then when the tornado came by, it took it the rest of the way up to the, uh, further into the frame here. I don't know that there was much hope for this home anyway, but uh, here's a construction practice that I don't think is real sound. Those are the, that's the, the basement. We're not together. I don't know what you call that, but. I can recognize that as not really great construction method right there. What about a brick house? A lot of people think, I live in a brick house. I'm safe, right? It's brick veneer, folks. It's not really brick house. It's a brick veneer. And if it's not attached to the home, I think I see one brick strap right over there. Here's a case where uh, CMUs with the top block there. I don't see anything really trying to attach the floor joist to that foundation. This is, I believe, it's, is it the Chastain Apartments up here northeast of, of town? Hmm? Chastain Manor. This was per, perhaps the most significant damage along the path. And this is where the engineers first kind of said, hey, EF5, and we're saying high-end EF4. But to me, if we're talking uh, a range of 190 to 210 mile an hour winds, that's probably correct. Unfortunately, EF5 category is right down the middle of there. So we're looking at a high-end EF4 or a very low-end EF5. But when we looked at the construction practices and the big picture, if we have, and again, kind of like the mobile home, that mobile home is destroyed, it looks horrible but there's tree standings and that front porch is still intact, you have to take, when you assess the storm damage, we kind of look at the whole picture before we go and call it an EF5. EF5 is like the genie in the bottle. Once you say EF5, you can't get it back. So we're kind of very conservative when we make that violent tornado designation. We want to make sure we do it right. Notice we have straight nails. I don't know if you can see the detail, but along the sill, sill plate we have straight nails, and I think the point was talk, talked about the, uh, the ground floor of that first building was swept clean. 
but it's not really the ground floor. It's kind of a split level. On one side is the ground floor, so we, but we had other portions of the structure here on this side that fed into that second story. Looking at the tree damage around it as well, not indicative of a really pronounced EF5 damage. Tim Marshall, Jim Ledoux looked at that damage and said, mm, it's really high. But when they went and they looked at other damage across Alabama before they settled on EF4, they went up to Hackleburg and said, no, a lot of difference between what was in Hackleburg and what was in Tuscaloosa. Here's some other practices. Uh, looks like a kind of a little bit of a hand waving attempt here at a better construction method using uh, a little bit of J bolt, putting some uh, grout in there and putting the J bolt in there. It didn't hold in this one case here. Sliders are not oysters in our business, nor are they greasy burgers. How do you feel about that home? It's horrible for that person that lived there. Look around the big picture. Are there trees down? No. Home right across the way? Nothing hardly damaged at all. This home was shoved off its foundation. That was the attempt to attach it to the sill plate. A lot of straight nails. I don't think a lot of straight nails is any improvement over one or two straight nails in my meteorologist's understanding of engineering. How was that sill plate attached to that concrete? Don't know. Doesn't appear to have been attached. Other examples, uh, this was in, closer down in Eclectic, closer to Montgomery. Um, can't really see it in the detail from where you're sitting, but again, straight nails into the concrete trying to hold that sill plate down. When we go to a site and we see that, it, it's kind of uh, disheartening for several reasons. One, we feel for the people that were affected by it. And the other is, man, if this thing had only been built up to code and up to standards, would it have been this bad? We face a whole nother dilemma when we talk about schools and other facilities that are, that are out there, public buildings. Um, what are we doing to protect ourselves and our children uh, when they go to school? I've done some on-site surveys uh, kind of helping analyze in some of the schools safe places for sheltering. It's really tough when you come up to school and it's all glass in the front. Okay, wow, where do we put the kids here? So many of the school districts in Alabama have really adapted a uh, send them home strategy. Um, that may be great in some neighborhoods, but in a lot of the rural communities, you're sending folks, kids home from a school to a manufactured home. And then again, there's the old idea of what do high schoolers do when they get out of school? Do they go home? They cruise, they go here, there. Um, that's kind of a challenge that we have in our communities with our leaders as far as what to do. Uh, in 2007, the Enterprise High School, the principal made the decision to keep the kids in the school. He took a lot of flack for that, when in fact he probably saved lives by keeping the kids in one place. There, were, there was loss of life, but it could have been far worse, I think, had he sent them home. Some of the neighborhoods in the vicinity of that school were totally, totally destroyed, and the chances of survival in some of those homes would have been even less. Wrapping up, and we're going to keep things moving for you here. All that considered, what are we looking at? 88% of all tornadoes are weak tornadoes. EF0, EF1. Could construction practices help the survivability of a home and certainly people in those cases? I kind of tend to think so. 11% are strong tornadoes, EF2 or EF3. And if I'm doing my math right, that means 1% of tornadoes are the violent tornadoes. And as far as construction standards, I don't know of many construction standards that can withstand that EF4, EF5. That's when we start talking about sheltering as your best option. Those reinforced safe rooms and the, and the shelters in the ground. Can't tell you when we go out and drive through northwest Alabama how many in-ground tornado shelters there are. Guess when they were built? 1974, after the 1974 super outbreak. A lot of people hadn't used them in 30 years but they used them on April 27th. They went to the storm shelters. Dominic was telling me about the storm shelter when you're driving up McFarland out in the field, there's a storm shelter sitting right out there where somebody survived in there. Most tornadoes, I think, are survivable if there are properly constructed shelters and the actions are taken. We've got two things going on here. We've got, is there a facility 
and then our people are going to go there. We're going to worry about trying to get the people there, and I think we need you to help us make sure that we have a place to go to. This was a very rare and historic event. There's no doubt about it. Would I have thought that I was going to be involved in a historic event when I woke up April 25th? No. April 27th, I woke up at 3 o'clock and went to work and realized it real quick what the day was going on. But the opportunity to be here today is as a result of that, I never thought I would be here today talking to you about the event we had on April 27th. It's really not a question of if it will happen again. It's a question of when and where. Thank you.